kind of almost feel like we should dim the lights for this one, but <laughs> actually, can we? Can we dim the lights? Is that okay, person in the back? Is that, do you, do you even care? Yeah? Does anyone know how to dim the lights? Faders. Dude, totally flip the faders. <laughs> Just slide them down. Let's see what happens. Oh, yeah. There we go. Now it's a presentation. All right. Come on in. Have a seat. We're cool. <laughs> This is how the Internet of Things will destroy us all. What you are about to witness has absolutely no useful technical information or content. You're welcome. Do I need a microphone? Do you want me to, uh, this? Oh, there we go. Is that better? The best mic is this guy? No. This guy? No. That guy? Yeah, no worries. Yeah, you can loon me up. It's cool. Is that better? Okay. Don't know. My name is Brian Lunduk. Right about now, you're probably wondering what my qualifications are to enable me to come to the Internet of Things Summit and talk about why the Internet of Things is going to destroy us all. We are going to be talking about lots of things, but not distributed denial of service attacks, because those are happening in spades, and those are going to happen a lot, and it's so disastrous, it's not even worth covering here. <laughs> We're not going to talk about nanny cams and creepy children. How many people here work on embedded devices that might get used in creepy children's toys? One, two, yeah, you're a little sheepish about it. That's adorable. Yeah, you suck. Um, <laughs> We're not going to talk about any of that. We're not going to talk about all of the myriad of problems that this raises, the conundrums, the moral issues, the technical challenges that almost certainly will not be solved. We are also not going to talk about the ridiculous amount of data that having a huge number of devices gathering data on you will be able to collect and provide to companies, governments, malicious people all over the world. We're not going to talk about any any of that at all. We are, however, going to be quoting the wonderful Dr. Ian Malcolm re repeatedly. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should, which applies to dinosaurs and Internet of Things devices. I love Dr. Ian Malcolm. Before we get too far into this, we need to kind of set a baseline. So we're all working from the same set of data here. This is the average lifespan of a toaster, is eight years. That's the average number of years that a toaster sits on someone's kitchen counter before it breaks so badly, because it probably broke for four years prior, but now it doesn't even toast anymore, that they chuck it out, right? About eight years, sometimes less, sometimes more. A refrigerator is 17 years, 17 years. Keep that in your mind, because that is critically important. Probably not that refrigerator, but some refrigerators last 17 years. That's a lot of years. This is the current forecast for Internet of Things devices. It's all over the place, but roughly stated is that it's going to keep ticking up until it hits around 75 billion devices in 2025. We've all been hearing stats along these lines, right? Probably so far people have been trying to say, hey, this is a great opportunity. There's lots of money to be made if there's 75 billion devices over the next 10 or so years. And that's a very good point. But that's also a very fictional number. When I count in my head, I get to about a million. And then I go one million, two million, many million. Because after that point, I, it's all just gibberish. It's hogwash. So let's visualize that. 
this is the growth. Blue is where we're at right now in 2015. This is where we're forecasted to be at in the next 10 years. 75 billion devices. Billion. How does that relate exactly? Well, <laughs> this is the number of IoT devices that are expected to be existing. This is the number of computers that are in use in the world right now. That is a smaller bar. This is the number of <laughs> smartphones in the world right now. If you stack all of the computers and smartphones on top of each other, it doesn't get up to the first line in the spreadsheet chart I have made. Nowhere near the first line. The number of Internet of Things devices so eclipses everything else by such an extreme margin, it should make our heads explode. This is the population of the world. Notice that the population of the world also does not come up to that first bar. There will be, in the next 10 years, enough Internet of Things devices, thanks to you people, <laughs> that every man, woman, and child on the face of goddamn Earth, literally every country, can have at least 10 of them. Minimum. Here's the population of the United States of America, the most consumer-loving country in the world. We are probably going to buy most of them, which means most of you are going to go home and have between 20 and 50 of them in your house. <laughs> Let that sink in for a second. Light bulbs, your stove, your appliances on your countertop, nanny cameras, your friggin' doorbell. The number of devices capturing data on you will be obscene. And that is not even the purpose of this entire talk. I just think it's ridiculous. So every now and then, the, the question comes up, and it gets asked to people like Bill Murray and whatnot, would you rather fight a horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses. I couldn't find a good Creative Commons licensed picture of a horse, so I went with rhinoceros. So let's think about this for a second. I mean, really, just completely clear your mind, stop thinking about Internet of Things devices for a second, and imagine this. You have these two options available to you. One is a gigantic duck. It was beautiful. Is that a mallard? I believe it's a mallard. Beautiful mallard, right? But terrifying when it's the size of a rhino. If that mallard breaks in right now, it's horrifying. However, I'm pretty confident that just the people in the front row, if we band together, we can take that duck on, right? Scary, but handleable. Or 100 duck-sized rhinoceroses. This is actually exactly 100. This took me forever to do. And uh, LibreOffice had a hard time with it, so I had to take a screenshot of it and make it into a picture and then paste it back into LibreOffice so it wouldn't friggin' crash when it got to the slide with 100 rhinoceros pictures on it. Uh, LibreOffice people, please fix the rhinoceros bug. <laughs> now, rhinoceros, say about the size of a duck, right? Yay, yay big. 100 of these bad mamajamas come in here. We're boned. It is over. Now, imagine this isn't rhinoceroses. Imagine, it, imagine these as multicolored internet-enabled light bulbs. I think that kind of makes its point for it right there. Um, now, let's think. Back up for a second. 17 years. 17 years with this refrigerator. Now let's imagine that this is a smart refrigerator with a cool little screen on it. It lets you put in your grocery list. It's connected to the internet so that it gets updates so that it keeps your food colder. I, I, I don't know exactly what an IoT fridge would do, but that's what it does, right? It's all connected up, super internet enabled. You buy it and you expect it to last as long as your old refrigerator, 17 years. 17 years ago from today, just to make sure we're in the right frame of mind, Brendan Fraser's classic, Bedazzled, came out in theaters. That was a great movie. Also, NSYNC's Bye 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 was topping the charts, right? I mean, everyone remembers that song because it's amazing. And this was the operating system for Microsoft. <laughs> Who's running currently Windows ME? Raise your hand. Oh, nobody? Well, that's weird. That's really real. I have one box that can still run it. 
you have one box that could still run Windows ME. I, that, that's fair. Now, Microsoft only supported Windows ME for three years. They had an extended paid support system in place where they'd support it for an additional six years. Now, even with that paid support, it was still a pile of crap. <laughs> but six years. 17 years is a very big bar. Now, I'm about to make fun of a company called Canonical because I do that in presentations, uh, only because they're an easy one to pick on. How many people are using Ubuntu in their IoT devices right now or planning on it? None? This is the best presentation ever. <laughs> awesome. Well, then we can all be on the same page with this one. All right. So the average appliance lifespan, let's say 17 years, right, for a refrigerator. Now, if we're working with a company that's building a platform, an entire platform to base that on, we want to feel confident that the platform itself is going to last 17 years, right? Now, many of the companies producing those platforms have not existed as long as you'd expect a refrigerator to last. So we don't know if they can deliver that yet. Now, that's not saying that they can't, but as yet, they have not actually done that. The average length of time for a long-term support release, you'll notice, and this is for Canonical's Ubuntu that they, they make, that's their platform, is significantly lower than the appliance lifespan of a refrigerator. Again, not to pick on Canonical here, because a lot of companies do this. Put your finger down. I don't, the Debian projects, Walter. Yeah, okay, now the Debian project, how many people are basing their devices on just Debian, like Debian Jesse or something like that? Smarter people, nice. Uh, again, we simply have no reason, there is literally zero reason to believe that basing it on a platform that has never run that long, ever, not one time in human history could run a refrigerator for that long, a device, an Internet of Things device, a headless, predominantly unmonitored, unmoderated, unmaintained device running for 17 years. Again, as long as since Windows ME came out. That would be as if Microsoft shipped Windows ME, we stuck it on refrigerators and stoves and let it run for 17 years. It would have blue screen by now. It would have blue screen by now. It, it would be absolutely friggin' disastrous. Now, ME started out crummy, right? If you start with a system that's good, maybe it buys you a little extra time. But 17 years? 17 years? I, I really don't think so. So yeah, mainstream support for Windows ME ended 2003. It is currently 2017. So support for the refrigerator would have ended how many years ago? 14 years ago? Oh, extended support. So if I paid for extra support for my refrigerator that ended what? Uh, math, eight years ago? <laughs> That's many years ago. That is so long ago. And again, Canonical is not the only one doing this. Why is this a problem? What potential conundrum does this, does this present to us? Can anyone guess? I mean, if we don't have security patches, we now have a vulnerable refrigerator. That's just the fact of the matter. If someone encounters horrifying bugs, we don't have anyone there to fix them. And even if we did, would anyone care? How many people bought a refrigerator 17 years ago, and that exact model of refrigerator, exact model, is still being made, supported, and sold in stores. How many people bought anything 17 years ago? One thing, anything, even a friggin' shoe, and that exact item is still being made and sold today. You have one thing. What do you got? Seven, okay, Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon aside. <laughs> anything that can be shipped on vinyl, I feel like doesn't count in this scenario here. The number two pencil. That is a really great point. Now stick the internet on the number two pencil. <laughs> now, imagine you've had that 17-year-old refrigerator running Windows and me, and you and everyone else in your town has that refrigerator. Every other device you have is also running Windows ME. And again, remember, in the next 10 years, you will have at least 10 of them in your home running Windows ME. And they are all rhinoceroses, and they're all pissed off at you. <laughs> that is clearly a problem. 
This is unprecedented. There has never been this many computers running at once, and they're all going to be friggin' connected and able to talk to each other. All of them. 75 billion of them. This has, nothing like this has ever existed before. Which leads to a slightly different tack for a moment. This is the number, number of flops needed to simulate the neurons of a human brain. It is one, <laughs> the 19, one with 19 zeros. I have no idea what the exact word for that is because it is so frigging huge, right? This is the amount of flops a Raspberry Pi 2 produces. It, uh, it doesn't even fill up the first pixel row. It is very small. A Raspberry Pi 2 is clearly not capable of becoming sentient by essentially simulating the neurons of a human brain. You can't do it. We'd like it to do it. That would be really cool. But it can't quite do it. It would actually take 1.6 billion Raspberry Pis in order to simulate all of the neurons in a human brain. That's a lot of Raspberry Pis. Does anyone know how many Raspberry Pis have actually shipped so far? My guess is it's less than 1.6 billion. That would be rad, but uh, it's nowhere near that. So that's the number of Raspberry Pis needed to simulate the neurons of a human brain. This is the number of Internet of Things devices that will be out in the world. Let's do a little math based on that. So verbatim, if IoT devices get no faster over the next decade, no faster at all than a Raspberry Pi, and again, in 10 years, come on, they're going to be a lot faster and they're going to cost a dollar. That's just the way it's going to be. The global IoT, IoT network, which I am coining right now as the GIN, by the way. It is called the GIN. I'm replacing Skynet with GIN. We'll be able to simulate the neurons of 45 human brains by the year 2020. 2020, guys. This is the number of movies where a global network of sentient computers don't kill us all. <laughs> Right? Now, I know this isn't, <coughs> we're not sitting here debating how to make these devices secure. We're not doing that in this session. I'm sure there have been plenty of security sessions so far at the IoT Summit. Let's just take a step back for a second. The reality is, no matter how secure you make these devices, it does not matter. They will be compromised. End of story. There is no way to secure them completely. It is simply not possible because it has never once been done. Never. And we are putting 75 billion of them up there that can now talk to each other to simulate 45 human brains. Not just 45 human brains. The full neurons firing in 45 simulated human brains that never ever go to sleep and share information with each other. Now, think about this for a second here. Think about that. Now, if we go back here for a second. So OK, this is the number of uh, flops needed to simulate the neurons in the human brain. Now, there have been a couple of attempts at, at uh, artificial intelligence and whatnot. And the general consensus is that it is a couple of powers less than that if we actually understood how the human brain worked, right? that we'd be able to simulate full consciousness and logic. So it's really more like, you know, not to the uh, like 17th or 16th power, which is still a huge amount. However, it is so many factors fold that if you theoretically got 45 of the best developers here at the Embedded Linux Conference and IoT Summit all together in one room, made them so they would never need to sleep again, could share telepathically all the information in their brains constantly with each other, and then let them work out how to create consciousness on their own, we now went from 45 human brains to a couple thousand operating around the world and never sleeping and knowing literally everything about you entirely. There's literally nothing they don't know. A little science fiction-y, sure. However, if we bring back in Dr. Ian Malcolm, if the Pirates of the Caribbean breaks down, the pirates don't, tr don't eat the tourists. This does originally mostly apply to dinosaurs, 
However, if you give a global consciousness, I know, I know it sounds ridiculous. If you give it complete access and control to your security system, your front door locks, all the lighting in your house, your oven, your lights, your toaster, your internet friggin' enabled crock pot, which I still don't understand why it exists, <laughs> and you give it access to all of those things in your house, it can destroy you <laughs> completely. Literally, not only can it collect data on you and sell it, it can murder you in your sleep because it has access to your gas and such. That is horrible and terrifying. <laughs> We've been in here talking for 16 minutes right now. I'm done. <laughs> this is literally it. I, I, I want us to take a step back here for a second because just like Dr. Ian Malcolm, who is a doctor, <laughs> said at the very beginning of this presentation, we were so focused on figuring out if we can, we didn't stop and think if we should. I would like people to re-watch this on the internet and think about that for a moment. I would also like to give props to the Linux Foundation for allowing me to come and uh, tell all of you that what you're doing is going to cause the end of mankind at a summit all about the Internet of Things. That takes balls and... Uh, <laughs> Props to the Linux Foundation for doing that. Now, that is where I'm going to leave it. Seriously, that's it. If you would like to ask me questions, if you would like to have an open Q&A about the gin, which is going to happen, <laughs> I will stay here and I will talk to you for the next 40 minutes. Otherwise, that is it. You may go, unless you want to raise your hand. Get out. But, <laughs> That's fine. Okay. But um, the civil infrastructure project, there are one of the people in the room with all of the other members. Sure. There are projects in the Linux Foundation, and they're looking at providing a base layer to, support, to do really long term support. And their definition of really long term. Really long term. What is really long term support? Is 10 years. So not enough for a refrigerator. You're not even making, no, I'm serious, you're not even making a refrigerator. Right. Okay? You're, you're not even making a refrigerator, and we're building systems to do things like monitoring power plants, monitoring water infrastructure. That's exactly right. So, yes. <laughs> there are lots of things that I do agree with you on, and those are issues... To be fair, I didn't have that many slides, so uh, really, you probably agreed with most of it. Really. Probably. <laughs> there we go. We're, we're going to get in the right direction now. If I keep this up, we'll eventually be at full agreement. <laughs> what do you disagree with me on, my man? Yes. Yes. And I've been doing embedded systems for long enough, okay? And the, the core thing that I'm going to tell you is a lot of those are what we quaintly refer to as power constrained devices. Oh, for sure. There's, there's, there's a ton of low power devices out there overall. What we really got to be looking at is what is the overall average speed of all basically IoT-ish devices over the next decade. And the reality is, how, how many years ago did the first Raspberry Pi come out? Does anyone know off the top of their head? Four years ago? So four years ago, how much speed increase has the Raspberry Pi itself, which a lot of people are basing their, their designs on, how, how much has that increased in the last four years? Pretty substantially. Like, the, since for the Raspberry Pi, the two to three, it was pretty huge. Do you have an answer to that, or it was a totally different question? <laughs> Okay. No, you can do a ton. 
Yes, so that's just it. I didn't even count the GPU on the Raspberry Pi because I thought about what this man just said. He's like, most of the devices are, are, are power constrained devices. A lot of them don't have powerful GPUs. A lot of them don't have those sorts of things. Raspberry Pi, yes, you can offload so many instructions to the GPU that you can do a lot better than what I even had on here, which means those 45 simulated human brains is an underestimation. But my, my thought is a general estimate. Mm. You're right. Class Some will. Devices. Um, totally. I still see a lot of places where what we're practically talking about are not much more powerful than a, than a five-year-old's uh, eight-bit or a sixteen-bit or in traction. Now, seventy-five making, billion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand that billion. <laughs> Yeah, if we connect 75 billion speaking spells, we are fucked. <laughs> uh, see, a couple other people have their hand. You, sir. Did you see how many people died in the Sarah Connor Chronicles? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> as... This is a good point. Yes, no. So your, your hypothesis is we will have 75 billion interconnected computers at a minimum. Potentially. Potentially, and uh, possibly quite sentient, but you would prefer that to the humans because the computers might be less likely to kill us, right? <laughs> Uh, then I will, I will posit this, because we have yet to see this come to pass. We have yet to see the fleet of all cars on the road being automated. We have yet to see what happens when, when all these 75 billion devices are online. And when it comes to pass, I would like to sit down and have coffee with you and let's figure out, did we survive or not? <laughs> I have my personal doubts. I like your optimism though. Yes, sir. Ah. Yes. Then this is. If you get exactly a big giant botnet, and again, we kind of skipped past that because how many people follow like on Twitter the Internet of Shit and things like that, right? <laughs> Most of us, right? So the reality is, if you follow that account and all of the other websites that track this garbage, the reality is we're seeing this sort of disastrous stuff happening constantly. There are botnets already wreaking havoc on our DNS servers on the East Coast and such, right? It's already happening. So we already have a case study, a series of case studies in place that show that those devices will without a doubt be compromised. The question is, what happens to them? What do, they, what do they do? What do people program them to do? Do they program them for machine learning, which eventually leads to sentience? Do they program them just to be the biggest, most annoying botnet in history? Do they program them just to be ransomware? We really don't know. Probably all of the above. I mean, that's, that's the likely scenarios. There's probably going to be a lot of countries, a lot of companies, and a lot of lone rogue hackers who just want to do all of their own things. So they're going to be all piggybacking on the same devices and, and compromising them in different ways. And you won't know it happened because the majority of the devices are headless and difficult or impossible to monitor in any real way. Yes, actually, you, you make a very good point. The solution is to make sure there are more than 45 bad actors hijacking all IoT devices at all times, therefore making them incapable of processing enough to simulate the neurons of a human brain. That is the solution. We should be enabling all of the InfoSec organizations worldwide to hack all of our machines 
on a constant basis. That is possibly the only solution because there's so much money in IoT devices. Companies are not going to stop paying all of you to build them. They're just not going to. It's way too much money to give up. Yes, man, who's asked four questions. Right? So, and, so the, the, reason I, the reason I can guarantee that is DEF CON. I don't have to say any more. The, the rest of the people in this room yeah. the rest of that story. Yeah. That's the reality, right? Now, the question is, once a device manages to become sentient, can it then protect itself and its own interests at that point? But that starts to get super sci-fi and a whole different track, which... I don't mind going down, but I think it's a little bit off track. Yes? So recently there was an article about how uh, Texas Hold'em was uh, uh, their AI solution for Texas Hold'em that beat uh, like five of the top five world players for 30 days, and their response was, it was like they could see my card. So the, the real question to the humans is, if you play Texas Hold'em online today, the robot could be killing you today yeah. at Texas Hold'em. Yeah. Yeah. When we when we sit down, a lot of our focus on building software is to destroy humans. Whether we're building a video game like chess or checkers, the whole point of its AI is to destroy us. If we building simple security measures into a server, the entire purpose of those security measures is to make sure that this guy right here can't get in because we're going to screw him over. And that's the reality. That's what we as humans have been working on for decades now is how to keep humans A, in check and B, out of whatever we don't want them in. So we need to keep humans dumb and complacent and compliant. We as humans have been building software to ensure that. And that's not a bad thing. We, we want to make sure that the guy in the red shirt is not getting in at all of our stuff because he's sketchy. Do, do you know our Secretary of Education now? <laughs> I, would like to, I would like to make a, a, a thing right here straight up. Let's, let's leave politics outside the room. <laughs> Because either way, we're all going to die. <laughs> a truly sentient AI, though, isn't even a prerequisite for this, right? Hmm. Like, the classic example is the paperclip, like the moderately intelligent paperclip factory. Yes. Decides that, like, well, the best way, the most efficient way to continue to produce paperclips is to just get rid of all the humans. That's not like an AI <laughs> deciding to protect itself or anything. Exactly. Just, like, these guys are destroying valuable resources that I need to turn into paperclips. You, That's a pretty simple It's a simple fact, one. It's a simple just, one that you and I could sit down and be like, okay, we've got a couple of robots in the factory that are automated. Let's add a couple of rules and conditions that will help make it more effective. And the reality is you're right. We could produce a very simple AI that is less complicated than a chess game that would kill everybody. Very simple. I mean, literally, you could put one line of code in an automated nuclear arsenal launching systems that is, um, if Kardashians get new show, then launch all. Like, <laughs> and it's, it's one line. Literally, we just need one line of code that gets checked in and compiled and in the wrong spot, and you die. You. The, the pissed off four-year-old is a frightening one. Now, it, yes, yeah, the pissed off four-year-old is a bad one. Okay, so so then, so let me let me see if I understand this. So if we if we get these AIs mature enough, and re, they reach a certain level of uh, development. They will simply become preoccupied with all internet porn and therefore not destroy us all. <laughs> so what we need to do is we need to jump past the toddler years. So they don't throw a tantrum, they just sleep until noon and then do weird things in their room. Okay. Uh, honestly, maybe? <laughs> Again, we haven't hit this point yet and I'm just really terrified of it. Like, what happens? Yes. Yes, okay, so take, 
take a security infrastructure like SE Linux and implement the, the three rules of robotics to keep us all safe so they can do no harm to humans, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe, how, but I don't even know how you do that because, <laughs> right? But I, I don't dislike that idea. So all IoT devices have to not burn humans with their toast makers, things like that. I, maybe? And, and that, of course, requires that everyone is using a distribution of Linux with SE Linux, and that that, that distribution continues to be patched for 17 years, minimum. Right? It's, once one gets infected, it spreads like wildfire. How many people here work for a company that produces like appliances, like, like devices that you physically hold right now? So quite a few of you, okay. How long, uh, uh, that company I'm assuming has been around for a couple of years? Yeah, okay. Going back a couple of years, just say two or three years, does your company still want to be investing in infrastructure and support for those couple year old devices on an ongoing basis after the devices are pulled from the market? Does, and does it's constant loss, right? So you're, as, as an appliance maker, you're saying, I'm going to sell this toaster, which I probably only had a $5 margin on after it goes off the store shelves anyway. I'm going to support it with a dedicated team of, let's say, the first three rows right here. Dedicated. Q&A people, developers, IT support specialists, people keeping the, the repository servers up and running, everyone constantly updating patching, keeping them safe and secure, they're not going to pay for it. No company is going to pay for it because it's a stupid idea. When there's 75 billion new ones being sold, you want to sell more new ones, stop supporting the old ones, and move on to the new and shiny. Otherwise, you're going to go out of business. But if you focus on just selling the new ones, you're going to make a butt ton of money, which is the metric unit. And you're going to make so much, it is going to be ridiculous. And so that's what will bring about our doom. Yes, bearded man. Since you brought it up, I'm going to mention, what about all of the companies that are trying to do this IoT thing and don't make it? They go bankrupt, they fall, they go out of business. Well, who in the hell is going to provide security and software patches and stuff for these devices when the company is going this is a really good point. So if the companies go out of business, whether it's the company that makes the device or the company that makes the platform itself, what happens then? Again, this company has not existed long enough to support a refrigerator. It just hasn't. And that's not a knock against them because you can't go back in time and found your company like in a DeLorean. You just can't do that. So I don't hold that against them, but it's a fact. They simply haven't existed long enough to show that they could be trusted to exist long enough into the future to support a refrigerator. Now, the most successful companies in like the Linux and open source space, let's say like Sousa and Red Hat, right? They've existed since the early 90s. That's great. Uh, I don't know that that's long enough to say put them in a car <laughs> because uh, my first car was from the mid 80s. <laughs> you know what I'm saying here? We expect certain things to last a long time. And Red Hat, Susan, and a lot of other companies haven't ex lasted as long as that. Now, those two companies have lasted long enough to say, make a refrigerator. But to make, I don't know, a station wagon or an entire house, uh, I would cause pause. I'd say, wait a minute, wait a minute. We, we don't know that for a fact yet. My parents own a restaurant, and they have a giant walk-in refrigerator that I think is over 20 years old. They get it, it has to be serviced all the time. Each and shit breaks. Yeah. But they don't, I don't know who manufactured it, but I know for sure they've never gone back to the original manufacturer and get it. They call the guy who's in his 50s and he's been doing this for decades. Yeah. And he fixes the repair. And he, right, independent repair people. So, right, independent repair people. So, probably the assumption that there's going to be an inter, inter, one of us is going to go out and be yes. an independent repair technician for smart IoT refrigerators is very, very slim. But, but it it's not impossible. Okay, so who, wait, 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 who, who, yes, the TiVoization. So how many people are developing devices right now who are working in some way on devices? Raise your hand. 
Okay. Uh, put your hand, put your hand back up. If those devices are built in a lockdown way, where there's no readily apparent way for me to get to a root access on the system and modify the devices, as a consumer. So most of the people that had your hands up raised your hands again because they they at least aren't making it readily available. How many people just downright lock it down? Almost as many hands go up. This is the problem. Clearly, now we have to think about this for a second, and I don't want to sound too crazy conspiracy guy-ish, but I know my tinfoil hat is showing a little bit. Um, the reality is there's so much money in this, I don't blame the companies you work for for locking them down. Their responsibility is to their shareholders, right? Their responsibility is to the employees and keeping them employed. They're going to do whatever is going to earn the most money. And what earns the most money is locking things down such that they have full control over the warranty and support of the device, which also gives them the opportunity to expire the device, to end of life the device, and have planned obsolescence where you need to go upgrade your toaster to the new device so you can get the new toaster OS 5000 so that your bread continues to toast. Yes, I know. But well, one of the things that <laughs> We do lock things down for security reasons. That's true. Now, I'm not saying that anything you said was wrong. All of those things are entirely <coughs> true. But I'm also saying that one of the reasons that we're moving the more lockdown thing is because the validation chain for that also improves the security of the uh, system. You're, you're absolutely right. Locking things down can, in fact, improve the security. However, can you guarantee that in those scenarios, the system cannot be hacked? Because exactly. Now, let me give you a little anecdote. I'll put your hands down for a second. Anecdote. I run a BBS, an old style BBS, right? Ridiculous. It's a DOS based BBS. I run it on top of FreeDOS, which is a GPL version of DOS. And it runs Telnet accessible 24 7. It's nothing big. It's got like 20 lines to Telnet into. Telnet. Is a Telnet a secure protocol? No, there's no security there. It's just ridiculous. You can hijack that sucker, no problem. That BBS has been under constant onslaught since two days after I put it up and a bunch of people thought it would be fun to try and hack it. They've been running every script they can think of to try and hack it. So it tries to do like run root type things in the login prompt of the BBS literally 24 seven for months on end. They have yet to be able to hack it. Why? Because the system is so ridiculously stupid and does so little, there's just nothing there to hack. It's literally that dumb. Now, that's running with an old version of DOS, an old version of apparently unhackable, hardened, SE Linux vaulted DOS, right? Who would thought that? Now, we've got our IoT devices. What operating systems are you guys using on your IoT devices? What are us? What Bare distro? Metal, baby. Bare metal, baby. <laughs> but you are using some form of Linux, uh, FreeBSD, NetBSD, anything like that? Probably most, right? Probably almost everybody. Not all, but almost. Those systems, while my favorite, and I love them so much in my heart, sorry, <laughs> they are infinitely more complex. There simply is no way to secure them entirely. It's not possible. Like literally, like it, approaching zero, it is, it's one of those lines, it's those little asymptotic lines where they almost touch but never touch. You can't quite secure them. You can just get really close if you put a thousand people working on it for literally ever. So it, there's no way to secure them. So if you, you can lock it down and make it so no one can update it, but all you're doing is saying that once they go out of support, no one can then continue to use the device in a secure way because it cannot get patches or cannot get patches easily. So locking down the device is astoundingly short-sighted in terms of both security and, uh, well, user freedom. But I won't get into the GPL soapbox. Any other questions? Uh, uh, we've got five minutes. Let's say five minutes. Any questions? If not, I can call it. And done. All right, now everyone go out, go to everyone who's sitting in the hall and ask them what their plans are 17 years from now when what they're running is a refrigerator. Thank you very much. Go out, demand answers. <laughs>